Good afternoon and welcome to Nature's Returns, Investing in Ecosystem Services, a webinar series hosted by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. My name is Corey Skult and I will be your host for today's presentation. As many of you know, the Nature's Returns webinar series addresses the growing importance of ecosystem service valuation and investment. Each presentation is recorded and available from CBay through YouTube and on the Yale iTunes U channel. Today, we are having a conversation surrounding the connections between human, ecosystem, and wildlife health. Our guests will focus on the economic costs of disrupting ecosystem services and of emerging infectious diseases. They will discuss the economic model they've developed for analyzing the total welfare impacts of using land for development versus conservation. Using an illustrative case study from Malaysia, they will lead a conversation on the disease regulation benefits of intact forest ecosystems, as well as how to prioritize conservation investments based on the generation of maximal social returns. Joining us on today's webinar are Allison White and Dr. Yasha Pfefferholz. Allison is a research scientist and member of the modeling team at EcoHealth Alliance, where she focuses on using spatial analysis and other statistical techniques to examine the emergence of infectious diseases. She also focuses on communicating scientific evidence to communities and stakeholders. Allison holds a bachelor's degree in public health studies from Johns Hopkins University and a master's of public health and global epidemiology and certificate in humanitarian emergencies from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Dr. Yasha Pfefferholtz is an economist at EcoHealth Alliance studying the economic consequences of emerging infectious diseases and human health. Yasha uses empirical data and mathematical models to explore how environmental conservation and sustainable economic development can dovetail to improve human, animal, and environmental health and well-being. Yash received a Fulbright scholarship to study his PhD in economics at the University of Wyoming, where his thesis explored the value of ecosystem services from forests and behavioral issues in environmental economics. Now, finally, I'd like to remind our listeners that there will be about 15 minutes for question and answer at the end of the session. We encourage your questions, and you can type yours in the Q&A section of your screen throughout the presentation. We will collect them and present them to our speakers at the end of the program. Now, I'd like to pass things off to Allison to introduce today's topic and EcoHealth Alliance's work. Allison? Hi, thank you so much, Corey, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, so as Corey mentioned, we're talking about economic costs of emerging infectious diseases and the value of land from a One Health perspective. So to get things started, I wanted to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, so EcoHealth Alliance um, is a nonprofit organization based in New York City. Um, we focus on doing research um, surrounding One Health. Um, so what is One Health? One Health um, works at the intersection of human health, animal health, and the health of the environment. Um, we focus primarily on a One Health approach to emerging diseases. We work with wildlife, livestock, and people using both mathematical modeling to target the most important geographic regions for emerging diseases, um, as well as focusing on surveillance in high-risk areas such as wildlife markets um, or pristine landscapes. We work globally in over 20 countries across several continents. Um, and in a bit, we'll be highlighting one of our projects focused in Malaysia. Um, first, I wanted to go over a little bit about some of our um, current research. So pictured here is our hotspots of emerging infectious diseases um, modeling that we've done. So the areas highlighted in, in yellow are areas that are at greater risk of seeing disease emergence. Um, and we did this by using a range of different variables, um, biologic variables such as mammal diversity, environmental variables such as land use change, and human demographic variables like population. Um, and looking at where diseases have emerged in the past and what factors those areas have to predict what other areas in the world have similar factors that might lead to emerging infectious diseases. So that's sort of an example of the type of modeling and spatial analysis work that we're doing when we say that we're doing One Health work on emerging infectious diseases. So now I wanna talk a little bit about why we're focused on emerging infectious diseases and why we think a One Health approach is appropriate. 
Um, so first, I want to just define what we mean when we say emerging infectious diseases. Um, we're talking about new disease not seen before in humans. Um, and why do we care about emerging infectious diseases? Well, emerging infectious diseases are a significant public health issue. So the majority of known human infectious diseases are zoonotic, meaning that they're shared with animals. Um, so that's over around 60%. And of those zoonotic diseases, more than 70% uh, originate in wildlife. Um, furthermore, emerging infectious disease events caused by wildlife pathogens are increasing in impact and through time. Um, more than half of the most recent emerging infectious disease events had a wildlife origin. Um, just for a few examples of recent emerging infectious diseases, um, Ebola, which emerged several decades ago in the 70s in Congo, um, but most recently had um, outbreak in West Africa. Um, MERS, which emerged in 2012 in Saudi Arabia. Um, there, um, so you can see this graph here shows the total number of infections and the total number of deaths. So you can see, um, although the total number of infections is not huge, it has a very high case fatality rate. Um, almost half of people who were infected died. Um, other examples of recent emerging infectious diseases are SARS and avian influenza. Um, there's a current avian influenza outbreak of H7N9 ongoing in China right now um, with over 300 human cases um, as well as significant impacts on poultry. Um, looking at poultry markets in terms of having to close down markets or cull animals. Um, so that's why we care about emerging infectious disease. So what we're trying to do is prevent diseases from spilling over and becoming epidemics, i.e. to stop pandemics before they start. So to look at that, we need to know what causes diseases to emerge. Um, so one of the things we've done is look at the drivers of disease emergence. And what we found um, from our analysis is that land use change is a significant driver of infectious disease. Over 60% of emerging infectious diseases over the past six decades um, have originated in animals, and nearly half of those were linked to land use change. Um, when we talk about land use change, that can mean a variety of different things. That's land use change caused by deforestation, um, agricultural intensification, um, as well as habitat degradation and fragmentation. There are a couple of theories as to how land use change causes disease emergence. Um, one is the pathogen pool hypothesis, which is basically saying that um, with land use change, um, deforestation, for example, humans, wildlife, and wildlife and livestock are coming to, into increased contact. Um, and the other, the perturba perturbation hypothesis, um, basically is saying that these land changes are altering the dynamics of pathogen transmission among wildlife, increasing, um, promoting cross-species transmission. So, talked a little bit about um, why we care about emerging infectious diseases, what's driving them, how does economics fit in? Um, what I really wanna highlight here is that the impacts of infectious disease extend beyond human health. Um, Outbreaks of disease may imply large economic costs due to damages. Um, for example, in SARS, you can see pictured in this red circle on this chart, um, there were huge agricultural losses due to poultry culling. Um, using a One Health approach that considers human health, animal health, and the environment, which involves incorporating veterinary medicine, wildlife surveillance, as well as forestry planning, can help mitigate that public health impact. Um, the second thing I want to point out just briefly is that um, these emerging infectious diseases have very high costs in terms of outbreaks, although sometimes a much lower public health impact. So you can see circled here, um, this 3.7 million is the cost per case of MERS in the Republic of Korea in 2015. Um, just to the left of that, you can see that there were 186 human cases, um, but the costs were around 700 million US dollars which is not to say that these um, diseases aren't important from a public health perspective, um, but just comparatively, um, 
you can see below, that 18,000 children die of preventable causes every day, um, which is higher than the deaths from the entire Ebola um, outbreak in West Africa. However, these emerging diseases are having a major economic impact. So how can we reduce that economic impact? One way is by using a One Health approach. Um, so this is just highlighting some of the impacts of using a One Health approach um, and doing preventive or early warning strategies. So that can lead to a lower overall health burden um, as well as a lower cost. Um, so what that means is um, this green at the bottom of the chart shows infections in wild animals, um, whereas the red and white show human cases. So by doing forecasting and, and detection in wild animals before diseases spill over into humans or livestock and uh, can prevent some of these costs. Um, and that's really why we're focused on using an economic approach, using the One Health approach, um, and focused on emerging diseases in a lot of our research. So what we wanna talk about today is one of our projects that I think does a really good job of highlighting how all of these things can work together. Um, and that's the IDEAL project, which stands for Infectious Disease Emergence and Economics of Altered Landscapes. So keeping in mind um, this framework that I've just provided, talking a little bit about what we do, why we do, what we do, why we do it, um, and how One Health applies, I wanna turn things over to my colleague Yasha to talk a little bit more about this project in detail. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alison. Um, so I'm gonna talk about IDEAL. IDEAL, our project IDEAL is um, Infectious Disease Emergence Economics in Altered Landscape. Uh, um, Alison talked about, about the drivers behind um, emerging infectious diseases. And, and one of the biggest drivers of emerging infectious diseases is land use change. So in this project, we are going to focus our attention on um, what, what are the economics of land use change. And one of the objectives of, of IDEAL is to understand the benefits of keeping intact forests to regulate diseases. So regulate diseases is an ecosystem services that comes from forests. And we want to understand how to, uh, how to choose the optimal amount of land to convert from forest to, in this case, we are gonna talk about palm oil. So from forest to development um, and see what are we losing and what are we gaining from that conversion. Uh, the second idea behind idea, uh, the second idea behind ideal is to estimate the economic costs that are avoided by reducing deforestation. Um, we want to estimate all the benefits uh, from converting land, but we also want to estimate the costs from that conversion and try to understand the trade-off between um, the benefits and the costs. Um, so what we did in IDEAL is um, we went to Saba. Why Saba? Saba is a small part of the Borneo Island in Malaysia. And there are mainly three reasons why we went to Saba. Saba, one, the first reason for why we decided to do this project in Saba is because ha Saba has a high biodiversity. There are uh, many animals that are in danger, um, and biodiversity and, and forest provides ecosystem services. The second reason for choosing Saba is because Saba has a high deforestation. 40% of Saba total forest area is converted into palm oil. Um, and has been converted between 1973 to 2010. From those 40%, 24% is converted to palm oil. And the third reason for choosing Saba is because of the weather. The weather allows um, this area to be transformed between um, forest into palm oil. Um, and so so th those are mainly the, the three reasons why we, we chose Saba. Um, and then the question is, why an economic model? Um, and the main reason behind um, why we want to study this through an economic point of view is because of palm oil. Palm oil is um, an important uh, area of production in, in Malaysia. 
um, they are um, so palm oil generates physical capital, which in turn generates wealth and jobs. Um, this means that that these people can reduce poverty and in the long run can uh, increase their human health. And because we are interested in that point of view of, of a one health approach, um, we think that uh, we can apply this uh, economic uh, model uh, in, um, in Malaysia. Uh, palm oil, um, we consume around 130 million uh, tons of palm oil in the world. And from those 130, 60 million um, comes, are, are specifically from palm oil. So 130 in total, at 60 million in palm oil. And from those 60 million, 85% comes um, from Malaysia and Indonesia. The second reason why we are interested in, um, in using an economic model is because we want to value these ecosystem services. There are many ecosystem services that come from forest. Um, we have direct use value like food or fresh water. We have indirect value, um, indirect use value like disease regulation, and we are going to focus on disease regulation. And we also have existence value and real option value. So in general, um, we want to um, uh, focus on this trade-off between the benefits from development and the cost from development. And the cost in this case are ecosystem services that we lose in terms of value. So um, when we are making a decision of land use change between choosing to develop or, or forest, um, basically what we are doing is a trade-off. Um, that means that we have an opportunity cost between choosing land to convert or land to develop, uh, land to convert or land to keep as forest. And the idea is, is, using, is estimating this opportunity cost to understand the trade-off through monetary, monetary values. Um, the question that we, we focus in this project in two questions. First, we want to answer how much foreign forest land should be developed or conserved. So that's the trade-off. And then um, we focus our attention on where that land should be developed to minimize the cost of forest loss and maximize the, maximize the benefits of development. What I'm going to talk about today is basically the question number one, how much forest land should be developed or, or conserved. Um, and this is, a, and, and this is a, um, a question that has two phases. We could ask about develop. So what is gain when an hectare of land is developed? Like for example, revenue for companies, tax collections that companies pay for jobs. This in the end uh, is traducing GDP growth and in the long run is traduced use in um, uh, human health. Or we could ask what is given up when a nectar of land is developed, and that is wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, and many other ecosystem services like disease regulation. And we could, uh, instead of asking about develop, we could asking about conserve, conservation. So it's the same question, but it's the opposite side of the coin. What is gained when a nectar of forest is conserved? So we are gaining wildlife habitat and all the other ecosystem services, or um, uh, what is given up when an hectare of forest is conserved, and those are the health from, uh, that, that, are, that comes from increasing revenue, increasing taxes, and jobs. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what are the numbers that we are using to calculate our, our model. Mm. In general, uh, because we are focusing on the benefits and the cost, we have benefits from development. Those benefits come from selling palm oil. Um, palm oil is a commodity that is uh, uh, an international commodity, um, and it could be buy and sold in, in the international market. But we also consider other values, um, like uh, rubber or logging, that are included in this model. So that's, those values are traduced in benefits for um, the model, but we also are losing ecosystem services and we are producing um, health damage that comes from malaria. Um, ecosystem services, we include freshwater cycling, carbon sequestration, nutrient cycling, and we are also uh, including uh, other ecosystem services related with harvest. Uh, in the case of malaria, what happens is that every time we decide to develop one hectare of land, we are increasing the likelihood of uh, the number of uh, cases of malaria. And those is traducing uh, monetary values. 
In this case, we have around uh, $1,500 per person as the direct cost of between public and private um, um, cost that is, uh, uh, that is uh, basically spent per person for each new case of malaria. Um, so in general, we have this one, one we call losses, the other one we call cost. Um, and basically what we do with all these numbers is that we use an optimization model that basically um, sum all the benefits and costs um, from that we've been talking about, and then we discount, we sum up to the infinity, and then we discount those to the, uh, to the present. So mainly, we, like what we talk about, we have rent, that is a gain in conversion, and we have um, ecosystem services that is that comes from forest, and then we have cost of conversion and cost that come from health damages. And this model is basically comparing at each point in time the social rate of return. So that's the social discount rate with the extra net benefit of developing one extra hectare of land. And then from this model, we can calculate what is the optimal amount of land that we want to convert from forest to develop. So what I'm going to show you here is um, a little bit of what we found. Here first, you can see a figure that shows uh, years from 1973 to 2060. And, and the vertical axis goes from zero to one, where zero is no development of palm oil and only forest, and one is com completely uh, development. And you can see this is what, what uh, happened from 1973 to 2014. And you can see that there's been a huge increase in development of palm oil. Uh, and today we have around 26% of um, palm oil plantations in all Sabah. If we compare that with what, what we, we estimate in our model, the optimal amount of land conversion, um, not including health, only including the ecosystem services lost from this conversion, we have that we should have less conversion um, through time and probably around uh, to, in, in the year to 2060, we should have around 26%. But we can see that the difference between what it's been converted and what, what our model says is much higher. If we include now health damages, that is the part that, that um, we, were, we were talking before, you can see that the optimal amount of conversion from in the long run is even lower, and it's around 18%. Um, so to finish, I'll, I'll show you um, this last graph that it's more, um, instead of uh, 80 years, is 160 years, uh, and it shows mainly what we were talking, um, that the rate of conversion is much higher, that we think it's the, it's the optimal amount, but we also include what is the optimal amount of conversion if we don't include the ecosystem services or um, the health damages? And as you can see in the dotted line, um, that's what we call the private optimum, and that shows the optimal amount of land that um, firms would convert if there weren't any uh, benefits from ecosystem services or damages from human health. And still, we can see that today we have a much higher rate of conversion than uh, the private optimum. So now I'm, I'm going to let Alison talk about um, uh, engaging with government, industry, and communities. Because in the end, what we think um, it's important is to be able to use this model to engage the community and use the results to, show, to share um, what we think um, uh, are they are they are, are um, the correct uh, right? So I'm gonna mute now. Great, thanks, Yashta. Um, so hopefully that gave you a good sense of all of the modeling, um, economic modeling that we've gone, and some of the data inputs that we've used to create our model. Um, but as Yasha said, um, the model is great and interesting, but um, it loses a lot if it isn't actually utilized. So that's the other component of this ideal project that I wanted to highlight briefly. Um, so we are engaging with government industry and local stakeholders 
Um, we're engaging with, engaging with government um, across all levels. So looking at national policy level um, government as well as state and local level government. Um, and then also engaging with local leaders, communities, um, and industry and private sector, which encompasses um, palm oil plantation companies as well as um, users of palm oil. And um, really what we're trying to do is to engage these stakeholders in our research so that we can improve our research and modeling um, and also hopefully have these tools that we developed be used in land planning decisions. So I just wanted to highlight really briefly a couple of the ways that we're doing that. Um, so we're engaging with scientific research communities um, through what we're, um, it's called the Development and Health Research Unit. Um, the Development and Health Research Unit is a unit based at the University of Malaysia in Sabah um, that we helped to establish. It's a, a unit to conduct multidisciplinary research focused on One Health, and focused on issues of health and development. So that includes economics, disease ecology, um, public health research, um, and really can bridge that whole gap. Um, it's also established to build linkages between industry and research. So they'll be working with faculty and students there um, so that they can use some of our model and understand some of those outputs and then in turn um, work locally to bring awareness of the linkages between health and land use and also this economic um, analysis to industry folks. Um, we also lead seminars and graduate research on um, on some statistics, on publications, and other topics. Um, we're also sponsoring a few local graduate student research. Um, and I just listed these here to give you an example of the breadth of the type of research that it's focused on. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is our work with communities. Um, and we have a health impacts of land use change toolkit. Um, this is a toolkit that we developed um, and it connect, connects human health with environmental change and development um, and is interactive and participatory. So we're really trying to link our research and scientific findings with actionable change. Um, so the goal of the toolkit is really for participants to understand how land use change can impact health and also to discuss strategies on how to mitigate and reduce the negative impacts of land use change. So in that part, um, we've developed this uh, toolkit. We've also presented it to the roundtable um, on sustainable palm oil industry members. Um, the roundtable on sustainable palm oil is a, an organization um, that has certain standards um, and members must meet those standards um, to have certified palm oil. Um, so we, at one of their annual conferences, had a side meeting and were able to present both our economic research and toolkits there. Um, and then we're also working to disseminate the toolkit to communities throughout Saba. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief snapshot. The other thing I just want to quickly stress is that um, this is focused a little bit on our community work, but we are also engaging with industry and policy um, makers to help them be aware of this issue and how the One Health approach and the economic approach can help. Um, and then the next step in that is um, really utilizing the model that Yasha presented in land planning. So um, to wrap up, I just wanna highlight a few key points in the presentation. Um, one is that there is a link between land use change and infectious diseases that has the potential to cause large damages to society, both through a public health impact and also through an economic impact. Um, and that our research suggests that resources are not being allocated efficiently. In Saba, too much land has been converted too quickly into palm oil. Um, and that's from a purely economically optimal perspective. Um, and thirdly, that One Health programs and a One Health approach can help increase human, animal, and environmental well-being uh, work together. And finally, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge um, all of our partners. None of this would have been possible without um, great support from our team here at the New York office, as well as in Malaysia. And um, you know, I talked a little bit about 
how this is a multidisciplinary effort, I think from our list of partners, you can see that it really has ranged. Um, we do really do have strong support. Um, and then also just wanna thank USAID, um, RDMA for their support in funding this project. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Allison and Yasha, uh, for the presentation. As a reminder to all of our listeners, you can type the that you have into the Q and A section of your screen, and I will pose them to our speakers. Uh, getting started right away with the first question. Uh, this one is more for for Yasha. Um, Yasha, you went into depth uh, with the ideal model about how much land to develop. Could you talk a little bit more about how you model where land should be converted? Uh, this is Allison. Um, I think I can actually um, talk a little bit about that. So um, we didn't present, in the interest of time, um, the other modeling aspect of this project, which is, um, as was mentioned, spatial modeling to look at um, not only how much land should be converted, but where land should be converted. Um, so I have a couple of slides just stuck in at the end um, to go over that. So we developed, um, so we did some spatial modeling to look at what areas throughout Saba are the most optimal for palm oil plantations. Um, and very briefly, um, this promotes, um, we use spatial data um, to determine if something's suitable or not. So on the right, this top map um, shows slope. So areas with a higher slope are going to be less suitable for oil palm. The trees don't grow as well there, you'll have less yield. Um, so we'll, uh, so the algorithm will try and avoid those high slope areas and promote areas with lower slope. Um, the lower map is accessibility, um, sort of with a similar idea, highly accessible areas um, might be better for development since it wouldn't require um, building of new roads and things. So we use that as well as some other inputs to determine what areas were most accessible um, or most suitable, sorry, for palm oil. Um, and also can exclude areas like high conservation areas, riverine systems, um, and things like that, so that you don't develop in there. And then this, sorry. So on the left here, this is our spatial model that just shows areas where you can see where, um, where the most, the most optimal areas to develop palm oil plantations are. This is um, a graphic because this is over an 80 year span. So considering the time element as well. Um, and just for comparison on the right, this is the current development in Saba. So the yellow areas are plantations. Um, and then you can see the green areas are protected areas. So those are areas, for example, where we would algorithm would say palm oil development is not allowed in any sense if it's a national park or something. Um, but you can also see some areas such as in northern Saba or western Saba where there are plantations but where a model has shown that it's not the most optimal area. Um, and so those are areas where we might want to look at the value of the ecosystem services there um, compared with the potentially uh, less suitable areas that might have lower, lower yield. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you so much, Allison. Um, the next question comes from a listener who is wondering uh, the, the case study that you use for Saba is extremely helpful for, for illustrating and, and getting an understanding of this, but how uh, easy or difficult is, is it to, to adjust the parameters to different contexts and locations? Um, yeah, this is Yasha. Um, we've been working um, so far with Saba. Um, we are expanding our work to different areas in Southeast Asia. Um, so we are adapting our model. Um, it's, a, it's a process that takes time. Um, we are not right now um, uh, in a place where um, we can like do this uh, uh, very easily. 
but our plan for the future and for this project specifically is to be able to provide um, people in these places with uh, software where they can input data and calculate these amounts uh, like much more easily than what what uh, right now we are doing. So, yeah. Great, thank you, Yasha. Um, we had a, a question about the model itself. I'm just curious on what the next steps in the ideal project are um, and whether you're using other modeling strategies uh, for the future of the project. Uh, yeah, so um, it's great. So, yeah, so one thing I want to highlight is that um, this is an ongoing project and we do have plans, as Yasha mentioned, to explain, expand to other um, regions, other countries in the region, um, and also to improve the model um, and be able to incorporate some other, um, other factors into the model. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is um, doing some modeling around haze. So in 2015 in Indonesia, there were um, major fires related, um, associated with palm oil plantations um, and a lot of peatland that was burned. So peatland is really important from an ecosystem services perspective because it tends to um, sequester a lot of um, to hold in a lot of um, carbon and CO2. Um, so burning it is really bad for the environment, but also there were major health impacts from that burning. So one of the things that we're looking at uh, modeling in the future is to incorporate um, health impacts um, beyond just infectious diseases. Um, the models that we presented right now, um, just to highlight, actually show um, malaria specifically. Um, so we're looking at incorporating other diseases that we're able to link with land use change and also include um, non-infectious diseases such as the haze, as well as look at other regions. Thank you. Um, we had one listener who, who pointed out that uh, in, in your graph um, for land conversion in Saba, it looks like the rate of conversion actually exceeded even the private optimum for just considering profits, not even taking ecosystem service and health values into consideration. Um, and this listener was wondering if you're recommending that these areas be reforested. Uh, and on a related question, uh, if even the private optimum level is below the current level, is that an argument that you can use in communications about why there should be less conversion uh, without even talking about ecosystem services and making health-based arguments? And does that help in your communication? or persuasion with local communities? Um, yeah, yeah, I think both are really good points. Um, so with respect to um, reforestation, um, all the work what, what we've done so far is to study what the past. So basically we, would, we were trying to say, look, um, the past was from 1973 to the present, we've seen all this amount of deforestation and we think, um, according to our estimations, um, that um, deforestation is too high. Um, we are not proposing right now reforestation because we, we don't have data on the cost of reforestation, um, but it's part of our plans for the future to not only um, calculate reforestation, but also uh, compare reforestation with other methods, methods of mitigation and adaptations that could be more effective and more efficient. Um, with respect to um, the second question about um, uh, the optimal amount of uh, conversion, um, that I, I think um, it was right. Uh, the optimal amount is uh, much lower than the deforestation right now. And so basically, one, one idea is that we don't need to calculate ecosystem services or health damages. Um, to say, look, you are um, deforested. We are you are um, cutting too much forest. Um, but also, our our part of the project, because we are interested in emerging infectious diseases, and and it's part important of, of what we are doing. Um, it's uh, incorporate these health damages into our model and and see the differences between um, the ecosystem services health damages and um, um, what would be the private optimum. So I think, yeah. Um, 
the answer is is yeah. We need to um, we need to consider that um, that only we are considering anything. Um, we have more deforestation, but um, it's important to calculate the damages from this deforestation. Sure, sure. And Thank you. This is Alice, and one thing I just want to add briefly is that we're also working with government and policymakers, and so. One of the other reasons we want to incorporate ecosystem services and health into the model is because, as we talked about, these services do have value. And so a lot of times those are costs that either um, communities or the government ends up paying. Um, and therefore, it um, could potentially be beneficial for governments to incorporate that into their analyses of profitability and revenues and have policies surrounding that. Um, so just, you know, I think for industry, and we found that industry is actually quite receptive to the health message and to the economic messages. Well, that's encouraging. Um, we had one viewer who was wondering uh, how the model, or, or if the model takes accounts for the, what the, um, forest land is converted to. Um, and so, you know, different, you, you were talking about palm oil plantations, um, but if other, if that creates its own health risks um, and fosters more disease vectors, uh, for example, if you have uh, widespread clearing for cattle farming, um, you know, what types of, if you have more fecal coliform in drinking water, if there are other health effects um, that are exacerbated by the industry that the land is converted to. Um, so how would the model need to be altered uh, to take account for different uh, goals of land clearing or different industries that the cleared land is used for? Um, so just briefly, so right now, um, the model is focusing exclusively on palm oil. Um, and that was partially because we're working in Saba where palm oil has been the bulk of development. Um, one of the things we're looking at is including other land use types, um, for example, timber logging and rubber plantations are also quite prominent there. Um, but it's correct, like to look at different land use types, we need to um, include different data and potentially different parameters. Um, some of our other research that we're doing at EcoHealth Alliance is looking at um, health impacts um, of agricultural intensification. Um, more directly, um, working with um, a few partners on that, but looking at um, emerging disease as well as infectious disease impacts um, there. And it is um, a very similar question, but you're right in that there are different health concerns involved, particularly if you're working with something like a livestock system. Great. Thanks, Allison. So we are pretty much running out of time, but we're going to try to squeeze in a couple more quick questions just because we've been getting so many. Um, we had one question on, uh, on the social perspective. What proportion of communities in Saba are dependent on palm oil production for their livelihoods? Um, and is there loss of livelihoods from uh, if land isn't used for palm oil uh, included in the model or policy discussions? Uh, I don't know specifically what proportion of yeah. residents in Saba um, depend on palm oil for livelihoods. Um, right now, we're not including that in our model, but talking about alternatives is part of the discussions that we have. Um, one of the other reasons that Saba is the focus of this is because it has very high biodiversity. Um, tourism is one of the main drivers in Saba, um, both um, marine tourism, it's one of the top dive sites in the world, um, as well as being a habitat to um, orangutans, sun bears, um, uh, pygmy elephants. Um, so I think definitely part of talking about the solution is talking about uh, other sources of development and revenue. And one of the things that we're not trying to say is that development is bad or wrong. It's that finding the right balance to make it economically optimal. Sure. Thank you. And I think I think um, um, it's important to say that. Um, Mostly, our work is very dynamic in the sense that every time we find new new things or um, data or anything uh, that related with our project, we we adapt our project and we start like uh, 
incorporating these new ideas. So this is not something that um, it's completely done, but it's changing through time. Um, and I think uh, because we have a lot of people here working in different areas, we can incorporate that new knowledge into our model. Great. Thanks, Yasha and Allison. Um, we'll end with one quick uh, ecology or, or kind of ecosystem question. Uh, delving into cost effect relationships, could you just clarify how conversion to palm oil affects the main uh, malaria disease vector mosquitoes? Um, well, sure. Um, I'll explain what I can. So there has been some preliminary research done in Saba um, by a different group looking at mosquito vectors in the area, and they found that um, in pristine forested areas, there, were, there was a greater diversity of mosquito species, um, and that in more disturbed areas, there was there were more mosquitoes overall by number, um, fewer species, and the species that were present were more likely to be um, species that could uh, transmit malaria. Um, so there are a few different hypotheses surrounding um, why malaria and some other mosquito-borne diseases have been linked to land use change. Um, there are studies in Brazil that have shown that the process of deforestation, that they see increased um, vector biting rates um, so that's one, um, one hypothesis um, that there are increased breeding grounds for mosquitoes is another. Um, so those processes are something that's still very much under examination. Um, the reason we included malaria uh, in this model specifically is because um, there is sort of the strongest evidence linking um, malaria with land use change. Um, and one of the other analyses that we're looking at doing is linking um, malaria and other diseases that have been identified by our partners as potentially linked with land use change or of importance um, with specific land use changes um, to sort of increase the body of evidence surrounding that. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, like to. Give a hearty thanks to our two speakers, Allison White and Dr. Yasha Pfefferholtz of EcoHealth Alliance for a wonderful discussion. The recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube and iTunes channel, so please check back for that. And last but not least, be sure to check out the CBay website and newsletter for more information on upcoming webinars. Until next time, this was Corey from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Have a great day.